This is what's called in the electrical industry a suicide cable. Uh, what it is, is it's a power cable where the polarity has been very carefully checked and double checked. We'll show that in a later segment of the video. Uh, with mail on both sides. This is used to link uh, two normally not connected uh, power systems in AC. Uh, for example, pulling a motorhome or travel trailer up to a building where for whatever reason the umbilical cord isn't going to be hooked up or it's broken or it's not long enough and you simply want to link to the nearest uh, power outlet to get one leg of each, each circuit going. This doesn't work with 220 stuff. It will work with half of a 220 type thing or 240 thing uh, so expect larger appliances not to work. For example uh, certain air conditioners or uh, dryers, certain uh, stoves, welding equipment, things like that, which require both legs of power to be working, are not going to work. Everything that would have a normal type of a plug like this, however, should work when, when this is done on the leg of the power that it's going to use. And I'll show you that on a circuit breaker in a minute. Before we get into the details and how to make this thing, if it looks relatively simple, that's because it is. How to use it, though, is very complex and has... Um, it can be unsafe, I'll tell you right now. If you do something wrong, uh, people can die. And that's one of the reasons why uh, licensed electricians can lose their license even for making one of these things, uh, supposedly. Uh, basically, there's a lot of threats that go along with it. In the RV industry, you're going to see these around. For Y2K, a lot of generator owners would have these because this is a quick and dirty way to get a generator to run a house without having to put in all of the extra safety switch boxes and protocols and stuff. Where people get drunk and stupid and fuck up is in not turning off the main breakers at a house. If you have a generator tied in to a building that is connected to the grid, there's two main dangers. One, the generator's AC power is going to oscillate at a different, slightly different frequency than the grid power. When those two meet each other, something pops, something breaks. That's why uh, power inverters that are grid-tie inverters cost significantly more money than non-grid-tie inverters. And that's because they have electronics inside which will tie that power to what it's plugged into. The other thing is um, grid tie inverters are made to automatically turn off if the grid turns off. That's a safety protocol that's built into them. Uh, one of the reasons you'll have those things automatically turn off when a grid turns off is in the event of a power outage you don't want to electrocute power line workers. Well obviously on this cable there, there's no safety switch. It's just a cable. Uh, I'm going to show you how I connect this up through a GFCI. Uh, I highly recommend only plugging these in through a circuit that has a GFCI. That's that extra layer of safety. But you could electrocute a power line worker if you do this where you have not turned off the main breakers to the building. And it's not negotiable. It's not something where somebody feels differently and feels a... Uh, this guy's a little shady, so I'm not going to do what he says. You absolutely, positively must turn off the main breakers to a building if you're going to backfeed that building with a generator. And the reason is because you're powering a line which you would normally not be powered. Now, the power line people will, as part of their safety protocols, uh, check those lines for power before reconnecting them. If they find that's hot, they're probably going to assume that somebody did a wrongful generator hookup, and they're just going to not fix it. If they don't discover it, well, you could be harming these people, and we don't want to do that. So I'm going to show you really quick how that works. Okay, now, from a safety standpoint, whoever is going to be hooking one of these things up carries it with them. You carry it with you. You don't do this from a separate room. You don't yell back and forth. You carry it with you. And you would turn off the main power to the building. Okay, and that's the first thing you're going to do. Turn off the main power, isolate this system from the power grid. The next 
thing you're going to do is you're going to find all your 220 breakers, which is basically two with a connected thing. See how that's a connected thing? You're going to turn all of those off that are relevant to your system. Now, for example, if I were to plug this in through a garage, I would leave that garage one on. But all the ones that look like they go to appliances, and there'll be a little guide up here, all the ones that look like they go to appliances, water heater, dryer, anything like that, they need to be off because when you power something up using a so-called suicide cord that is only going to be feeding one circuit, we, we don't want those devices getting confused and only getting half the power that they should be getting and then something gets messed up. So we and I'm not doing this this is just for the video demonstration what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be operating this on an isolated system which is a um, motor home so we can do that for demonstration but here if we were going to power this building with that generator running what we would do is we turn the main breakers off we turn off all the 220 breakers uh, except if for one reason, let's say you're going through an outbuilding that had its own 220, for example, the garage here, we would leave that one on. You do that with the, uh, the cord in your hand. Then you can safely connect it. Now, when you do safely connect one of these things, uh, and I'm not connecting this, but when you do connect one of these things, and you've made it with a lighted receptacle, I'll show this later in video, you would connect the, uh, uh, connect the uh, the dead end first, and then uh, you connect the live end, and preferably have additional switches in there so that when you're actually powering up the circuit, you, you power up that circuit by flipping a switch on something that's associated with a GFCI, and if that trips, you unplug it, you figure out what was going on, you go from there. But generally speaking, the generators have a GFCI, and uh, I'm, I'm going to be using a power strip of the GFCI for the demonstration, which is going to be just on the motorhome, not on the building. Okay, so here we've got our system. You see that light's on. We're going to kill that system. We plug this end here. We know we're safe. No indicator light has come on. We plug this in here. And when we turn it on, we are have indicator lights. Now I'm going to show you how this thing went together. Okay, so pre-assembly using the lighted plug end. And another thing, if you really want to go deluxe with this, go with the lighted plug ends on both sides. That that's even better. But uh, and and having a shorter plug with lighted plug ends on both sides would be perfectly good, if if not slightly better than what I've got here. What we do is we become very aware of the polarity has to be correct on this. Green is going to be the ground, the white is goes on to the white screw, the black goes on to the colored screw. Now that's going to correspond to something that you'll see in a lot of power cords where you'll see that this one that the white would normally go on is slightly wider. On this it's not slightly wider, so if this ever becomes broken off you need to replace it. You're, you're dealing with an inherently unsafe homemade product. That's why these are never made, uh, never available in stores, and you have to make them yourself. Uh, it, it's almost a way. To, there's several ways that accidents could happen. It basically weaponizes the power grid. Uh, maybe we'll discuss that. Maybe we don't. But this is kind of an emergency use or improvised use item, and we're going to show you how that's made. But basically, you have to put the little collar on here. We make sure our polarity is in, we make sure everything's tight. Make sure there's little shoe things on here that the wires go underneath those. And it's all good, tight, and firm before we close it up and run the screws down. This, the way these are made, you can only rerun those screws a couple of times before you ruin something. And so uh, we'll get it back together and show it in action. What that will do is that allows me to plug stuff into other plugs and items on the circuit in the motorhome which it pretty much had everything wired together to use the same AC uh, thing, except there's a couple of things that require two legs of power, like the onboard air conditioning, and those aren't going to run. Uh, but as far as uh, lighting and 12-volt uh, stuff, like this is 12-volt lighting, this is going to work under these circumstances because the AC to DC converter 
runs off the same circuit as, a, as the uh, plug on a dashboard. And what that allows is you to use an otherwise conventional extension cord and uh, you know conventional industrial work job site extension cord and a uh, power uh, management to power something that normally uh, may may not have a compatible cord or compatible system. But again, this is going to be something that's independent. And remember, if your power goes out in a building, and you're and I, if I were using this to backfeed the building, absolutely positively turn off the breakers, whether or not the power is out in the neighborhood. If the power is out in the neighborhood, you still turn off those breakers to the main power grid before you use one of these so-called suicide cables to backfeed the system. The other recommendation I have is uh, use the thickest cables you can get a hold of. When I was at Home Depot buying a, an extension cord and a cable end, I, I bought the 14 gauge uh, or the 12 gauge instead of the 16 gauge. It's kind of hard to find 12 gauge cables on those, but I, I think I found a 14 gauge that would work. And on these power strips, what you want to do is get a hold of some of the old early to mid 1990s models. Um, to, to no, no newer than the mid 2000s. Basically, you want ones that were made to power old style laser printers and monitors because they can handle more power. Okay, so if it was made to run an old style laser printer and computer monitor on a uh, on an outlet, it, it probably is going to handle the full four, 15 amps, if not 20 amps where if it wasn't made to run laser printers and old style 600 watt color monitors then it it may only actually be able to handle 5 to 10 amps so that's that's how the whole thing works